Famously described by Alistair Campbell as having a brain the size of a planet, Lord Jonathan Sumption had a legendary career at the bar, which he concluded by acting for Roman Abramovich before being elevated directly to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. Join us on this episode as he shares with us his journey as an advocate and, well, how he was at one time a very poor student. Today on Advocates, the podcast, we welcome Lord Jonathan Sumption. Uh, Lord Sumption, thank you for being with us today. A pleasure. Let us start what we normally do with our guests and ask you to tell us a little bit about your, your background, about where you're from, and a little bit about your parents and your growing up. Precious. An autobiography. Well, <laughs> I was born in 1948. Uh, I am basically a Londoner. I um, owe most of what I am to my schooling and my university education. I spent three years as an undergraduate reading history at Magdalen College, Oxford. And uh, after taking schools in 1970, I became a history fellow of that college and remained there for the next four years. Uh, after that, I changed trades and became a barrister. I was a barrister for... Sorry, if I could walk you back a little bit, I'd like to sort of break this up into being a little bit more granular. Oh. Your schooling years, I understand from some of the public material that I've read up, you obviously at Eton, but there was one point in time when you were at the bottom of your class. Is that I true? I don't know where you got that from, but it's oh, true. Right, okay. <laughs> it's uh, from a Guardian article, <laughs> probably some years ago. I see. And you were, the, the article speaks of a moment when you were crossing the, uh, the, the yard at, at Eton when you decided that mm -hmm. all that was going to change. And why was that? Because I decided it was quite useful to have some ambitions. I had had none before. Okay, you said you just basically decided to have ambition. But where did that ambition come from, actually? Goodness knows. Where does anybody's ambition come from? <laughs> so, suddenly you decide that it might be quite uh, a good idea to have an interesting life. Right. And uh, that involves a certain amount of ambition. It can be in any field. I had some, took me some time to work out what I might be good at. But the idea that I ought to be good at something seemed an obvious solution to my rather basic problem. And uh, in terms of university, so you obviously decided that ambition was there and um, you went to university and uh, Magdalen College in, in Oxford and you read um, history and medieval history. So could you explain to us why you chose history and why medieval history in particular? Well, um, in the Oxford History School, you can't specialise too much in any one period. Uh, I was interested in medieval history, but I'm actually interested in all history. It's just that unless you're a real polymath, you can't write about all history. So I, I chose to read about the Middle Ages. Why history? Well, I had enjoyed it at school. Uh, I thought that it was a wonderful subject because it's a literary subject. It uh, is an immense source of vicarious experience. And I think that it's very difficult to understand anything about the world until you have understood something about its past and about the experiences of humanity, which are surprisingly similar in most periods. And when did you start specializing in uh, medieval history? Or when, would that, when did that become your focus? I regarded that as my main interest already when I was at Oxford. And it was uh, certainly what I taught and what my research subject was when I became a fellow of my college. And wh what did you enjoy most about academic life in the four years you were there? Well, what I enjoyed most about it was the independence of mind, the fact that um, I had to, obviously to satisfy the fellowship that I was doing some serious work, but the exact nature of the work and how I did it was left very much up to me. Uh, they basically left me alone to find my own feet. It's a huge privilege to be able to spend, at that time of one's life, I was in my early 20s, uh, a few years studying a subject that you find fascinating, more or less free of financial concerns, because although 
um, Oxford Don don't get magnificently paid, they certainly get adequately paid. Uh, so I was able to do exactly what I wanted for four years. That was terrific. It was something that I hadn't necessarily expected, but it was an enormous opportunity. And you wrote one book while you were a fellow, which is uh, Pilgrimage, an image of medieval, medieval uh, religion. I-, I was wondering, I don't know whether it's possible, but can you give us a sort of snapshot of what the process is in, in, in writing a, a historical book? Well, it's fairly obvious, really. Uh, it requires a very great deal of reading. That particular subject didn't require much in the way of manuscript research, but it involved a huge amount of research in printed books. I had chosen the subject basically because I wanted to write about something that covered a very long period of history and that told us something about humanity. But religion is, along with war, uh, the most significant collective activity of mankind for most of its history. And I thought that it was a subject which would enable me to write about a thousand years of history and to run a a continuous theme through the whole of that period. That was quite an ambitious thing to want to do. Nowadays, looking back on it, I don't actually think that I did it as well as it could be done. I was too impatient. But I did, as you say, eventually publish the book. And why the change after four years um, from history to to law? When I uh, became a Don, I expected to make... Uh, that's my career. There were a number of reasons why I decided to change my mind about that. To be quite honest with you, the number one reason was the money. I was I married young. I wanted to start a family. And I didn't want to be enormously rich, but I didn't want to be enormously poor either. So I looked around for some other intellectually challenging work that paid better. There were actually other reasons, although that was the main one. One of the other reasons was that in the early 70s, universities in Britain underwent a really very significant change in directions which I didn't find very appealing. The amount of administrative work increased enormously, and the extent to which one was supervised, hemmed in, and basically had one's life organized for you by regulation greatly increased. It has continued to increase ever since, but I decided when this began, which direction things were moving in. I decided that I didn't much like that direction and left. And your father, who I mean, was, was a submarine commander, as I understand it, in the, in the Second World War, and then also practiced at the bar, did he inspire you at all to the bar? Or was that completely independent thinking on your part? It was completely independent choice on my part, really. Uh, My father went to the bar very late in life. He had been a solicitor immediately after the war and then became a banker. Uh, And he ran into financial difficulties as a banker and decided uh, in his late 50s to become a barrister. So, in fact, uh, he and I became uh, barristers not very far apart. Right. But we interviewed Jonathan Crow in the previous season, and he's also, uh, he was also, his first degree was in history in, in, in your college as well. And we asked him this question. We'd like to ask you this and see whether the answer is any different. In, any different. But are there any... Sim- I, I don't tell me in advance what he said. No, 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 I won't. No, so anyway. <laughs> are there any similarities in studying law and studying history? Yes, there are. This probably only applies to... English law, common law, but the common law is an intensely historical process. It's often quite difficult to understand the major rules of common law, which is essentially a system of customary law, unless you also understand the historical circumstances which produced them. I mean, a good example is the law of land. The law of land and trusts uh, essentially originated in the priorities of 18th century English gentlemen to preserve their families' associations with particular pieces of land and in particular pieces of house, pieces of building. So that's just one example. 
there are lots of others. Now, um, of course, one question you ask yourself when you come across a, a rule of land law or any other kind of law in the 21st century is, does this still make sense? Is it still the law? And I think that it helps to understand why it ever became the law. You can then begin to decide whether it still plays a valuable role. Land law is an example of an area of law where the priorities are utterly different in the 21st century to what they were in the 18th. But nevertheless, it's a system which makes sense. It's part of the adaptability of the common law. But when you look at a particular case about, say, land, you may feel, well, that's one aspect of land law that we can now do without. And it does help to know why we ever had it in the first place. I mean, this is one small example of the way in which English law has grown up by a process of very gradual accretion. And being a historian not only makes it comprehensible, but also makes it more interesting. These things are not desiccated codes like continental civil codes. They are laws that grew out of human experience. And a historian ought to be able to understand that. And do you think that, as you uh, phrased it, that vicarious experience makes you a better barrister, a better lawyer? Yes, I think it does. I mean, everybody needs vicarious experience. History is just one source of it. The problem is that to really understand humanity, you need several lives, but one is the rule we're given. So being able to study the lives of generations past uh, is a source of experience which we can never entirely replicate from our own personal knowledge. Going back to your career change, did you consider that to be a big risk at that time? I mean, I know you were talking about the, the academia changing, but really, to be frank, you were doing quite well. Right, you had a book published. You had an Oxford Don, and that's that's pretty a good life, actually. And for you then to yes. change, yep, was that was that a risk? Then? Well, it was a risk. Hmm. Yes, it was a risk. But I mean, I was twenty five, and uh, at twenty five, you think you're bomb proof. You're <laughs> wrong about that. But that's the way people are, and that's how I was. So yes, I knew it was a risk. The problem about getting into the bar in the 70s, and indeed today still, yep. is that there's huge demand for pupillages, huge demand for places in chambers, and most people fall by the wayside. I knew that, but I thought that I would be okay. Now, of course, that, that is something I probably wouldn't have said to myself if I'd been 10 years older, but I'm glad I wasn't. <laughs> and to some to something more prosaic i mean in 1975 how does one convert from a, a history degree to being qualified for the for the bar well it was easier then than it is now because you could do most of the bar qualification exams by correspondence course until about the early 70s you could actually do all of them by correspondence course when i started you could do the part one by correspondence course. You then had to attend a formal course for part two, which I did the moment that I left Oxford. Uh, and you then had to do a pupillage. So that, that was basically what was involved. I was able to do the part one while still writing history. Not very difficult. So, yes, uh, that was going to be my next question. Did you find law a challenge after, after history? No, law is easy. I've always thought it's easy. What's difficult about practicing law is the facts, not the law. Okay, so let, me, let me just go back to why, you, why do you say that law is easy? Well, nobody, not even the most learned judge, knows the whole law. Uh, Dr. Johnson said uh, more than 200 years ago that there are two kinds of knowledge. There's the knowledge you have and there's the knowledge that you know how to get. Well, in most fields of life, the knowledge that you know how to get is probably about 90% of it. Now, law has a finite range of sources. It has comprehensive textbooks. It's not that difficult to look up uh, what the law is, or, or at least to find out that nobody knows what the law is. 
in which case you have the interesting task of persuading the judge to make some new law. And then if I can turn to the, to the facts, and you said that's the difficult part, and why do you say that's the difficult part? Because uh, truth is elusive, and the facts, even when you know them, can be hard to classify. You not only have to know what the facts are, you have to know which of them is really relevant to the legal proposition, and uh, you have to be able uh, to classify facts, to work out what kind of facts they are and what their relevance is. Now, that is, I'm not going to tell you that that's a Herculean job, but it's more difficult than finding out what the law is. Most litigation uh, ends up by having very few differences between the parties about the law. In general, uh, once they've battered each other about a bit, or been battered about by the judge, they tend to agree on most of the legal propositions. What they're really arguing about is the correct legal classification of the facts. And that's what most cases turn on. Just coming now to your choice of the bar rather than as a, as a solicitor, did you ever consider the two options or was it always advocacy? It, I never had any doubt that if I was going to be any kind of lawyer, I ought to be a barrister. And why is that? Because one of the reasons that I'd left Oxford was that I did not like hierarchy. Uh, I liked to be an independent operator. I am, like many barristers, constitutionally unfit to be employed. And <laughs> so I went for the branch of the law that gave me the maximum of independence. Could I ask a lot assumption, after changing from being an Oxford Don to, to a barrister, did it, was there a moment in time, maybe after two or three years of practicing, and you thought to yourself, thank goodness I did this because I'm pretty decent at it. Was there, yes. was there such a moment? Yep. Yes, it wasn't a single moment. It gradually dawns on you when people start giving you instructions uh, <laughs> without uh, having their arms twisted by your clerk. But I wouldn't say there was a single moment. Now, I decided, I mean, I didn't actually originally think that I would be that good as an advocate. I, but the moment I started, I realized that advocacy is fun. And finding something fun is the first major step towards being good at it. So can I, can I just split that into two? The first is why you thought you might not be good at it. And the second... Well, I've never done it before. Ah, okay. But I mean, surely you would have stood in front of students and lectured and given seminars at Oxford. Yes, but uh, the imbalance of knowledge and expertise is very great in that context. I knew hugely more about the 12th century than my pupils. Uh, addressing judges is a different thing altogether. And when did you find it fun and why? I found it fun almost from the word go. My chambers was very good at finding useful small work for uh, junior barristers and pupils to do. Uh, indeed, the first advocacy that I ever did uh, arose because my chambers had an arrangement with a firm of solicitors which acted for insurers, uh, for motor insurers, and they needed barristers to go and put up some kind of defence for uh, insured parties who were accused of motoring offences. They didn't want them convicted because it made them rather, rather more difficult uh, to uh, negotiate a deal with the other side of the accident. So you spent uh, your time going off to, to <coughs> magistrates' courts and defending people on small motoring offences. Now, that's not intellectually the most stimulating branch of law, but it was enough to persuade me that this was actually uh, an entertaining thing to do. I mean, advocacy is a, a, a very interesting exercise. It's a process of intellectual argument under ground rules that are designed to prevent evasion. Most of us, when we have arguments with friends, or over a meal, we cheat. You can't do that as a barrister. And can I ask you in, in your, your route to the bar, I mean, you ended up in, in Brig Court. I think you spent the, all your career there until you, until you went to, to the bench. How did you get there? And why was it civil work over crime or any other area? Well, it was very difficult in the 1970s to choose which field you practiced in. 
uh, it was so difficult to get pupillages and tenancies that you basically took whatever you could get. Uh, in the 1970s, sets of barristers' chambers were not organized the way they are now. They didn't have organized systems of recruitment. You couldn't very easily apply to them. They were basically run by the head of chambers, who was usually a complete dictator, often a very benign dictator, but a dictator even <laughs> so. And you needed an introduction. Uh, I asked my father, who had been around for, for some time, had, had been slightly involved in politics and had been a solicitor, if he knew any barristers, uh, particularly any heads of chambers. And he did. He knew Anthony Lloyd, who became Lord Lloyd of Berwick, the law lord. And so I got an introduction to him, and that was how I got my pupillage. That was not in Brick Court Chambers, it was in another chambers. I had enormous difficulty uh, getting a tenancy. I tried just about everyone in the field in which I'd been a pupil, which was commercial law, uh, and got turned down repeatedly. I spent about two years as a pupil trying to find a place to practice before being taken on more or less off the street by Brick Court Chambers through the good offices of a very helpful an extremely senior uh, barrister in the chambers, the last chambers I did a pupillage. Well, and was that just purely because of the competition for places then, the inability? It was partly for that reason. And it was partly because as a, a former academic in a subject other than law, a lot of people assumed that I was simply doing this for fun and wasn't actually serious about practicing. I remember a particular moment when my first pupil master, uh, I invited to dinner one day with my wife and myself. And there were about six of us around the table. And about halfway through the dinner, I heard my pupil master turning to my wife and saying, tell me, um, what does Jonathan intend to do with himself after his pupilage? Uh, I was rather shocked by this. I thought it was obvious what I intended to do with myself <laughs> after my pupilage. But it clearly indicated to me that at least this pupil master had not even thought it was possible that I might actually want to practice at the bar. What on earth he thought that I was doing <laughs> in his chambers, I simply cannot imagine. Not, not particularly per perceptive men, your first pupil master, I must say. <laughs> well... Nobody knows what's going to happen. <laughs> yes. Uh, and let me ask you about life in chambers in, in the in mid-70s when you joined Brick Court and compare it to when you left in 2012. Tell us what the big differences were um, between then and, and now. Well, one difference was that there were, I think, less than 20 members of chambers uh, when I joined Brick Court. There were, I think, only two QCs uh, that's so uh, one tenth of the membership of chambers. When I left, about a th the, the whole strength of chambers was something like 90, and about a third of them were QCs. That's one big difference, the sheer scale of it. Secondly, uh, chambers were not particularly well organized uh, when I joined uh, in 1977. Uh, they became highly organized. But when I joined, believe it or not, the chambers was basically run by the head of chambers and the senior clerk. Nobody else had a say about anything. There, there were no committees that would have been regarded as a sort of impertinence to impose a committee on the head of chambers. There was nothing collective about the way that chambers was run. It was essentially a dictatorship. Because our head of chambers lived in Wales, this meant that the effective control of chambers was exercised by the senior clerk, who was an absolutely outstanding, a brilliant senior clerk, but a, a real old-fashioned tyrant. He, I learned a lot from him. Mr. Burley. Uh, he, yes, he was an extraordinary and wonderful man, but nobody would have called him a pushover. Right. And in terms of, uh, clearly that uh, you learned a lot from him in terms of of the practical aspects of, of practice, you'd have seen far more than, than many barristers, I'm sure. But in terms of barristers, did you have any early influences? Well, the man that I worked with most often at that time as a junior barrister was Robert Alexander. 
He was, in his day, the most celebrated advocate at the English bar. I think that's fair to say. About two years after I joined Chambers, Sidney Kentridge, who had previously practiced in South Africa, also joined us. And he, I think, I would describe as the greatest advocate that I've ever heard. The fact that I thought that he was even better than Robert Alexander shows how very good he was, because Alexander was really outstanding. But I got a lot of work through Bob Alexander as his junior. May I ask, uh, is there a difference between the style of advocacy in the 70s and but and by the time you left practice in 2012 yes there it's not a radical difference but there are differences for example the role of legal scholarship is much less now than it was you do need to know your law but for example in the 70s the standard technique of advocacy on a point of law was to pile in the authorities. You read case after case after case that supported your point of view, and case after case after case that didn't support it, but for which you had uh, to have some sort of explanation consistent with your case. That's very different now. Uh, judges now, first of all, they do a lot more reading in advance. Judges in the 70s had no knowledge whatever of either the facts or the law of the case before you walked in and, and started speaking. There were no skeleton arguments. There were no advanced documents at all, except in the House of Lords. But now, judges get skeleton arguments in advance, some of which are not at all skeletal, but very long indeed. Uh, they, uh, they've read a lot, uh, and you basically start at the first floor. You do not make friends among judges by reading enormous numbers of cases, Generally, what you do is you go to the case uh, that is at the highest appellate level which supports your case. You may go to one or two more, uh, but you outline the relevant legal propositions essentially from, with the minimum of citation. For that reason, uh, hearings are a lot shorter. A case that lasted a whole week or even two was perfectly commonplace in the 70s, but it's quite rare now. Now, you, you explained why you ended up in, 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 in uh, brick court and commercial work. You just followed, followed the work, basically. But I think if one looks through your career, and especially your career on the bench and, and post the bench, uh, you've obviously got an enormous interest in, in constitutional law. Uh, and was that something that developed later, or was that something that was always there, something simmering there? Always? No, it wasn't always there. Uh, it, it's quite true that I've become increasingly interested in constitutional law. It's very much what interested me as a Supreme Court judge, and it's continued to interest me since I retired from the Supreme Court. It happened quite gradually. Uh, in the 90s, I um, withdrew to some extent from the commercial law disputes, which had been my bread and butter for quite a long time. I had acquired a reputation as an advocate, and as an advocate who wasn't afraid of going into new fields. And the government started to employ me uh, as a barrister in contested court cases. Um, I, uh, the government work is extremely interesting. Uh, the government is a, a very good client. On the whole, they, they listen to advice. On the whole, they're on the side of the angels, though there are exceptions to that. And so I became interested in public law. It was a period when public law was becoming increasingly important in the English courts. Even before the Human Rights Act, judicial review had expanded enormously. And I, even in the commercial field, there were judicial reviews. And of course, once one moved into doing a lot of government work, that was what it, what it consisted of most of the time, judicial reviews and inquiries. Right. And you were appointed uh, Silk in 86 at the age of, of 38. What was the process like in, in, in those days? You applied to the Lord Chancellor on a form which covered only one page. It asked you your name, uh, your professional address, a few other nondescript details, and how much you earned. The last question was the decisive one. Uh, basically, 
they expected you to be at the top of the earning scale for your particular field. That was how they, um, <laughs> they determined it on the form. Now, that wasn't all there was to it, because there was, there was then a process of consultation. The names of those who'd applied were circulated among high court judges uh, and circuit judges in the area where they practiced, if they were circuit practitioners. And a huge amount of material would come in that way. The Lord Chancellor's Department used to keep files on people in which complaints uh, or praise were carefully recorded. It was actually rather an unfair system. In most cases, it worked all right. Uh, but in some cases, people were deprived of appointments because they had fallen foul of some judge and a black mark had appeared in the Lord Chancellor's file and they never got round it. Uh, that was the big downside of the system. On the whole, however, I think it probably worked as well as the very much more cumbersome systems now where you have to fill in uh, a form that I think is now six or eight pages long and write long self-appreciations. <laughs> there was none of, that when, none of that when I applied. And after you took Silk, um, could you tell us what's the main difference in the way you worked compared to when, you know, your years as a, as a junior? Well, in the last few years of my time as a junior, I had been doing basically Silk's work. I normally, I, I think I probably hadn't been led by a, by a Silk for about three, three years before I actually took Silk myself. And I frequently led other more junior barristers. The main difference is that you stop doing pleadings. I quite liked doing pleadings, but there are more interesting things. You did less of the sort of grungy work like advice on evidence, and a higher proportion of it was actually appearing in court. So that was a plus as far as I was concerned. Right. And sorry, just let me wind back a little bit to what you said about Sidney Kentridge, and you said that, that he was the best advocate you had seen. Could you pinpoint for us why you say that about him? It's terribly difficult to identify what it is that makes any advocate compelling. In Sidney's case, it is the gravelly voice, the extraordinarily slow delivery. I would never dare to speak as slowly as he did, but it's very effective. The humour and the extraordinary ability to uh, identify the critical point at an early stage. Now, of course, all of us had to identify the critical point at some stage. But in Sidney's case, it was very strange. He would sort of be presented with a pile of lever arch files about a foot high and would somehow know by a process of, um, of intravenous injection <laughs> <laughs> that the critical document was in file C at page around 200. <laughs> and it wasn't that his junior had told him this, he just knew where it would be. Could I just ask you about um, your experience after becoming a QC? Then obviously you, you led people then, right? You had these teams of juniors. And after a while, I think you started leading other QCs as well. What is your view on this? I mean, how do you approach this? Do you actually take the position that as if, I suppose, you are a singles player in tennis at the end of the day, everybody else is supposed to revolve around you and feed you? Or do you feel that you are more like, a, I suppose, a star striker in football where there are, there are midfield players supporting you and so on and so forth? How, how do you, what was your approach? It's a mixture of both things. It's very personal and different leaders differ. I have always found it very difficult to delegate. Uh, it's partly that until you've worked out the, the facts and the law for yourself, you don't actually really understand them completely. Uh, barristers who take the law from their juniors, however good the juniors are, tend to be underprepared. Um, it's, it's only when you've studied it yourself that you can really deal confidently with the byways that tend to open up unexpectedly in the course of any forensic argument. Um, that made me a rather frustrating person to work for in a, in a team of barristers. Uh, the, the area where I found juniors most helpful 
was, well, first of all, that they could point you in the right direction so that although you did the work yourself, you knew where to start, and that's invaluable. But secondly, I found that particularly in very fact-heavy cases and very document-heavy cases, having a good junior who can alert you to potential lines of cross-examination both for you and against you is an, an invaluable resource. But although I got on with all of my juniors, at least I hope I did, there were really only a handful who I worked with so often and who we intuitively knew so well how we worked that really uh, he was essentially like an extension of my own mind and vice versa. <laughs> That's a very useful situation, but I mean, it's not that common. But there were perhaps half a dozen who were in that category. And let me just follow up on, on what Ruslan's asked you, just in terms of, where, as you say, you've got to do that sort of reading and the, the law yourself in order to be able to deal with the byways. Does that mean that when you have a, a new problem or a new area that you've not uh, dealt with before, you hit the books yourself and pick up the textbooks and pick up the law reports and start trying to find a map of how this thing works? Absolutely. I mean, very often I found myself uh, leading somebody on appeal in a case where I had not appeared at first instance or in the House of Lords where I hadn't appeared in the Court of Appeal. And the first question you ask yourself in that situation is, well, why did we lose? Usually, if I'd been brought in at that stage, it's because we have lost. <laughs> and you do have to start looking at case or case with new eyes. I very frequently found myself taking over cases which had been perfectly competently conducted in the courts below, but where you could see when you read the judgments and looked at the papers that there was actually a much better approach, uh, which perhaps might have been more profitably argued first time round, or perhaps it may be that a more senior court would find it easier to take an approach that was different. So you have to hit the books yourself. And were you um, someone who used uh, or still uses LexisNexis and those sort oh, yes. of devices? Yes. I mean, that came in really during the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, and legal research engines are invaluable. I actually find it very difficult to study a case properly without a hard copy in front of me. But for identifying which cases you should be reading in your hard copy, the research tools are absolutely invaluable. It used to take a month of Sundays to work out every case in which some decision had been cited. Standard research technique, you, you come across an important case or a case that seems to be interesting. You ask how often has it been cited? Has it been approved, disapproved, expanded on, and so on? Now that used to take ages because you have to go through the indexes of the law reports, which were published decade by decade. And then you spend hours looking up cases that turned out to be about something completely different and of no interest at all. With a, the search engine, it's very fast. You identify the cases in 10 minutes. You go through them looking at the gobbets that the, um, that the, 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 the website will throw up 10 lines on either side of the citation you can tell immediately that it's a load of rubbish and start to move to the next one. And it take, you know, a, a job that took two days can be reduced to a couple of hours. Uh, but what, what's your first port of call? Is it the textbooks or do you immediately turn to Nexus Nexus? Usually it's the textbooks. I mean, sometimes there is a dominant case in a particular area, the point of reference around which everything revolves, that's where you go first. This episode of Advocates the Podcast is supported by Taylor's Law School, where you master the skills, tactics, and ethics that these top advocates will be talking about. Coming to your some of the leading cases that you that you did, you know, that, that you, obviously the Hutton Inquiry, um, the Abramovich trial, and, and and Three Rivers, and the you know, the very big cases. But I wanted to ask first about about the Hutton Inquiry and something that I read from that Guardian article a tactical decision you made to get Alistair Campbell to, to hand over his, his, his diaries? It wasn't a tactical. Okay. He hadn't had asked for them. Ah, he asked for them. I see. Okay, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that. He'd asked for them. 
Um, it was described as a decision that you made in the, in the Guardian. So that, that's, um, that's uh, what you No, no. Uh, Hutton had asked for them. They weren't government documents. And they were, they were Alistair Campbell's personal documents. And so technically, he didn't have to produce them. The government had given an undertaking to Hutton to supply the relevant documents, but that didn't apply to individual witnesses. But uh, he had asked for them. And on the whole, it's a good idea when conducting inquiries to do what the judge wants. I wanted to ask about tactical strategic decisions that you make, which are slightly sort of non-legal, not strictly legal, uh, not strictly factual. And how big a part that plays in, in, in your process in approaching a case? Well, the process of deciding what the line ought to be is, I mean, there isn't a standard technique. It's, it's a question that you really ask about every case, and the answer can turn up in, in, in very different ways. In the Hutton inquiry, I took the view that it was probably not sensible uh, to make the inquiry into a technique for hammering the BBC, which was one of the other respondents to the inquiry. Uh, and, but otherwise, the story has to be allowed to tell itself. Good point. Now, these, these cases are, I mean, they're high profile, they're high profile at the time now, they're still very important cases. Did you find that those, those sort of high profile cases gave you any different pressure or any pressure at all? The profile of a case doesn't affect the amount of pressure you feel under. I mean, I never felt that pressurized. I tried to avoid overtrazing. I tried to avoid taking on so much work that I couldn't do all of it as well as I wanted to do it. So I basically am not, was not the kind of practitioner who ever felt under that much pressure. The profile of a case can make you a bit nervous. TV reports or press reports on the day's proceedings all the time. And I did quite a number of cases in which that was true. But ultimately, you just have to ignore it. And can I ask you about your, the preparation for cross-examination? So, I mean, we're dealing with cases now like the, uh, the Abramovich um, one. What do you think the role of cross-examination is? Well, I think cross-examination is clearly vitally important in most cases involving disputed facts. Uh, it can be a very unfair proceeding because... If the barrister has done his job properly, he should know a great deal more about the case than the people who are actually involved in it. However competent a witness is, he is not going to remember every detail of what happened maybe six, seven, ten years ago. Uh, but one of the aspects of modern business methods is that pretty well everything fetches up somewhere in writing. Not necessarily in a memo, but in an email, in a telex. That's why uh, modern cases are so document heavy and why buried in unexpected corners of the documents are often nuggets of gold. Now, normally you would expect a, a competent barrister to know the documents in huge detail and he therefore has the advantage of the witness. The witness is not allowed to speak except in answer to your question, because certainly in England, uh, uh, his witness statement will be taken as his evidence in chief. The emotional cards in court are stacked against him. So it is, I think, an inherently unfair process. But before a good and even-handed judge, it should be possible for the judge to correct for the unfairness of it, but not to take too seriously uh, the ways in which a, a witness can, in all good faith, slip up. And the process is extremely efficient at elucidating the truth. You have to have two things at the outset. You have to have a complete grasp of everything that's in the document, because the, the witness may have an answer that you haven't anticipated. He very often will. And unless you know where the document is that you need in order to chase him down whatever rabbit warren he's gone and done, uh, you're not going to do a very good job. So knowledge of the documents is the first thing. The second thing, which may sound obvious, but is surprisingly often ignored, 
is that you've got to have a very clear idea of exactly what you're trying to prove. You are not trying to make the witness look like an ass. That may be an incidental consequence of the process, but in many respects, uh, a witness can be very helpful if you treat him with courtesy and not obviously as an enemy from the way, from the word go. The object is not to make the witness look foolish. The object is to get admissions out of him that help. And some of those may come very easily. Some of those may be more difficult to extract. But many cross-examiners go into a cross-examination uh, with all guns blazing in every direction. And that is not a sensible way to do it. Uh, first of all, it takes far too long if you do it that way. And secondly, uh, it means that you quite often miss the target. Uh, it's only after the event when it's too late that you realize what you should have asked. So you need to know what you've got to prove, what you do not wish to have proved. Uh, uh, you need to have, in other words, a coherent plan which is closely related to your view as to what the law is. I just want to ask uh, Lord Samson regarding his approach of doing cases, particularly cases like the Abramovich case, which is essentially, you know, there's no law there, it's purely fact, sure, no, dispute. Absolutely no law at all. It was 100% right. fact. So when, when you approach cases like this... a swearing this, match between... Two, yeah. I mean, it was a very extraordinary case, a very unusual yeah. case. Yeah. Uh, if you had told me in advance... This is a dispute uh, between two businessmen. And the one thing that they are agreed on uh, is that several hundred million changed hands under a deal which was uh, not documented, an oral deal that was not documented anywhere. It would have been hard to believe. But that, as I say, was the one point on which they were agreed. Uh, it, it was a, a very strange case. And, and so when you approach a case like this, which is purely factual. My question to you, is, uh, there, there are two areas actually I wanted to ask you. Firstly, when you in preparing this case, particularly for your cross-examination of Boris Berezovsky, you took nine days to cross-examine him. Did you... Yes, I did. Yeah, do you, do you actually have basically areas which you, you, you intend to go into and with a particular target, i.e. this is the ev evidence I want to elicit from this particular area? Or... Do you actually write down the questions that you ask, or do you just, or for you, it's just merely well, curious? Right. No, uh, I, I make very, very full notes, ah. but I, I depart from them very often. I make notes, I, I uh, note what questions I intend to ask, and I note against each question what the relevant documents are, what the answer might be what on various hypotheses is the follow-up. But well, that's my own technique. I do that not so much because I intend to follow the route map that I set out in that way. I do it because it's an excellent way of thinking through the factual issues and getting the documents under your mental control. When you're actually cross-examining somebody, you cannot go woodenly through one question after the other in your notes. Yeah, that's it right. helps to have them there, but you very often find that you have to turn over 10 pages uh, because a whole ream of it's become irrelevant. You very often find that an answer that the witness gives makes it necessary to depart from your notes entirely, and that's where really knowing the documents comes in, and also where coming, having a, very, a good junior comes in, a good junior who can put a, a critical document that you may not have remembered in front of you at the crucial moment. My second question, Lord Sumption, I suppose this is on you as a judge now. When hearing an, on appeal cases like this, right, and you have highlighted the fact that witnesses now, witness statements now are, are the, there's no more examination in chief. The witness statement is taken as, in Malaysia at least, where we practice it, it's taken as read. And straight away you go to cross examination then. And then I know you, you sat as a judge in the Supreme Court, but uh, in terms of weight, I mean, I find a, a lot of times that's a bit unfair on the witness because, you know, it's a strange environment, he's not ready. And immediately the questions that he's faced with are invariably hostile 
So how do you, uh, what sort of weight can you then give as a judge to answers that he gives under these kind of conditions? Well, you're absolutely right. And it's the reason why I said a few minutes ago that I thought that although cross-examination is a very valuable tool for finding facts, it can also be very unfair, exactly the reasons that you give. But, I mean, as a judge, you have to make allowance for the fact that the witness is forensically a lot less experienced than his cross-examiner. My experience is that in spite of the fact that the cards are stacked against you, an honest witness is always able to resist an unfair line of cross-examination. There may be exceptions to that among witnesses who, although honest, are wholly inarticulate, but any judge will intervene to ensure that that sort of witness is not bullied. The kind of disputes that I dealt with, I was cross-examining very experienced businessmen. They were, they were pretty articulate. That was often their biggest problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Could I turn now to uh, to appeals and your and your approach to preparing uh, for appeals? As you say, normally you come in if you've been, if you've been brought in, it's because they've mm-hmm. lost in the court below. What are your approach? What is your approach to to dealing with uh, with appeals? Well, it's a much shorter process. A higher proportion of the material will have been in the written material submitted in advance. As an appellant, you start out from the fact that. Uh, unless the judgment below is manifestly mad, uh, the, ju- the, the appeal court is going to make the assumption that the judge got it right. So you basically have to seize the interest of the court. You have to be selective about the points that you take. It's often counterproductive to take absolutely every point that was taken below. You've got to, you've got to work out, first and, first and foremost, why you lost below. Right. Now, something I've noticed about, about you that, st- that struck me, and, and this is watching you speak publicly and you know, today as well, is that I, I, I don't think I've heard you stumble for a word or an er uh or an ah uh like um, so many of us. I'm wondering, is that training or is that just something that's just come to you very naturally? I think it comes naturally. I think in sentences with subjects, verbs, and objects. <laughs> We clearly don't. Okay, we we clearly don't. <laughs> Could I ask, in terms of the trial process and the appellate process, which one did you enjoy more? I enjoyed the appellate process most, but I always made sure that my clerk realised that I wanted to do one serious witness action a year, because it it keeps your hand in. It's a variety of experience just doing appellate work. I think would be less interesting, but one was enough. And what did you enjoy more about the appellate work? I enjoyed the fact that by the time you get to a court of appeal or the House of Lords, the issues have been distilled. There's no floundering around wondering what the right questions are. One knows by that stage. And so you are able to move straight to what are the critical and most difficult uh, issues which account for your having lost below. This is a, it's a much more selective process. It is a much more, in a, in a way, it's a much more intuitive process. Nobody likes the feeling that they dropped a point uh, which they might have won on, but you have to take that risk. Okay. Now, uh, while you were a barrister, you sat as a, sat as a deputy high court judge and a judge of the Court of Appeal in, in, in Jersey, in the, in the Channel Islands as well. Uh, my question is, what was your first impression of life on the bench? It's not that different to life at the bar. Oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all judges start from the answer and work backwards. And uh, the, they differ in the degree of brutality with which they are prepared to <laughs> not barriers out of the way before they decide they've got to change their initial view. Barristers ask themselves pretty well the same question. They are, of course, limited by what is in their client's interest. But you start out by asking yourself, what's a judge going to think of this? Uh, How is a judge going to react to this or that argument or this or that fact? The main difference is that when you become a judge yourself, you've taken the shortcut. Now, just to ask you a very sort of 
uh, again, prosaic question. For appeals, for for uh, submissions, when you when you have to reply, you have to take a note. Uh, and it's one of the things I find the most difficult thing to do is deciding what you take a note of. So what's your approach to that? I don't take a note of what my opponent has said. I take a note of what I am going to say in reply. That means you have to leave, leave large spaces between the lines for the things that only occur to you later. Okay, okay, that's good advice. Now, quickly dealing with just your, your continuing career as uh, an historian as well, I'd really like to know, what, what were your days like when you were at the bar and then writing these three volumes uh, of the, for the Hundred Years' War? I do not come back at night, switch modes, and start writing about history. I admire people who can do that, but I can't. I come back, uh, I either have to do some work on the case, if it's continuing, uh, or else I help myself to a large glass of wine, and I'm then good for nothing for the rest of the day. So the writing of history takes place on days when I'm not in court. Weekends, holidays, one of the great advantages of the bar is that one's timetable is quite flexible. You can take long periods off. Uh, also, many cases settle or go short. When that happens, uh, I didn't used to go and stand on the cab rank and wait for the next case to come in. If I'd taken on a three-week case and it settled the day before it was due to open, I would take the three weeks off. And is that what sort of gave you that time? I mean, obviously, you, in the Hundred Years' War, there's a lot of reference there to sort of original manuscripts and things like that. That gave you the time to actually travel to, to, to read those manuscripts. And yeah, absolutely. Right. OK. And your love for languages, is that a result of history or is that independent of history? It's mainly a result of, of history. I've always been pretty well bilingual in French. Uh, I was educated at a French school when I was very small, and I never lost the habit of speaking and reading French. Other languages, the great revelation is that at a certain point of one's life, one suddenly realizes that speaking and reading, particularly reading foreign languages, is not very difficult. It seems daunting. I remember the first occasion when I actually picked up a book in French. I'd been speaking and understanding French for a long time. But at the age of about 12, I decided to read a book in French. That might seem a pretty obvious thing to do, but it had always put me off before the need to do this. And I found actually it was enjoyable. It was, it was Guy de Maupassant's short stories. And uh, I thought I'd do it again. So, and, and again with other languages. I mean, I I have learnt very few languages formally. Obviously, I learnt French formally. I learnt Spanish formally, you know, did exams in this and that sort of thing. Most languages, uh, and I also, I also learnt German formally in an odd way. I, I went to a Goethe Institute in Germany when I was young and spent some months there learning basic German. And then uh, when I wanted to brush my German up about uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I used to have a tutor who came to see me at the Supreme Court once or twice a week and used to talk to me uh, in German. You know, just ordinary conversation, what, what you know, news stories, life in general, anything like that. Most other languages I have learnt by simply bludgeoning my way through them. That's to say, you take a, a document or a book, you get a grammar, uh, you get a dictionary, and you just, you start. At first, it's extremely slow going. The first page of the book might take you two hours. When you've done that for a few weeks, it's 20 minutes, and eventually 10, 5. I'll take your word for it a lot sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm not going to do yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> away from the career at the bar, you're coming to, a, to nearly the end now. I'm sure you're, you're gratified to know. Why leave the bar for the Supreme Court? I had refused to become a judge before my appointment to the Supreme Court. I'd been asked on a number of occasions. 
And basically that was because I didn't feel like starting again at the bottom. The judge will hear a lot of cases which as a senior and experienced barrister wouldn't touch with a barge pill. A um, lot of humdrum cases. Much of the work is interesting, but much of it is also very ordinary. The Supreme Court is a court that only does interesting work. I can't actually remember more than one or two cases that I find dull in my whole time as the Supreme Court. It's also a chance to make law at the highest level. Intellectually, it's the most challenging and interesting job that the legal profession had to offer. I never expected to have an opportunity to go to the Supreme Court uh, without having gone through first instance court and the Court of Appeal before. When that opportunity arose, I think I would have been a fool to, to reject it. And can you tell us sort of the contrast of life at the bar compared to the Supreme Court? Well, my answer would be very similar to the one I gave you a moment ago. Cases look much the same from both ends of the court, and the intellectual processes involved are much the same, except, of course, that a judge is not limited by the four corners of what it's in his client's interest to establish. And what did you observe about the bar from the Supreme Court bench that you didn't see while at the bar? Well, in the Supreme Court, you hear a large variety of advocates on almost every subject under the sun. And you get to know who are the good ones and why they're good. Um, my main bugbear about the bar was specialization. The bar of England and Wales is a large bar and it's therefore breaks down into a number of very specialized areas. In my view, uh, to be a good lawyer, and particularly at appellate level, you need to understand what's going on in the legal room next door. So specialization can be an impediment. There are barristers who come into court with a grab bag of useful cases on their particular subject. Let's suppose it's bicycle mortgage. There are five cases in the books on bicycle mortgages, and they know every one of them. Do they ask themselves, well, look, what's the basic principle about bicycle mortgages? And how does it differ from mortgages of houses, cars, or anything else? The ability to look at legal problems at the most basic level, and to understand that the common law has certain basic instincts which are common to many areas of law, is absolutely vital, especially at the appellate level. So that the barristers that one appreciated most are those that have a grasp of the basic principles underlying the whole field of law, and why, as is very often the case, that some decision in an area utterly remote from bicycle mortgages, or whatever it happens to be, may actually be the key. To unlock it, yeah. Now, uh, Lord Sumption, I, I'm about to appear before you in the, in the Supreme Court. Uh, how would you describe yourself to me as a judge? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think I talk too much. Uh, I try to restrain that, sometimes successfully. <laughs> okay. And was there anything that, You'd, you'd look back and go, no, that's something I didn't enjoy about the, being on, on the Supreme Court. Well, one gets very cross in some cases with one's colleagues when they disagree. <laughs> now, that's not always the case. Very often you change your mind. Very often the case is one which admits of two reasonable answers, but no more than two reasonable answers. And... All that's happened is that you take one of the reasonable answers to be true and your colleagues take another. That doesn't make me cross at all. Sometimes you feel that your colleagues are being a bit obtuse and they think the same about you. That's frustrating, but there's nothing you can do about it other than change your mind. Lord Sumption, Lord Diplock uh, famously was known as a judge who almost never changed his mind. Yes, are you that kind of a judge or are you willing to be persuaded by advocacy? I've, I have frequently changed my mind. I've 
sometimes changed my mind about what the answer ought to be. I very often changed my mind about what the reasons for the answer ought to be. And one is persuaded by advocates, one is persuaded by one's colleagues. Lord Diplock was in some ways a very good judge and in some ways a very bad one. He made up his mind too early. He was too dogmatic. He expressed principles of law in a way that read like statutes and were, had a tendency to decide all sorts of cases other than the one before him in a way that subsequently turned out to have been a mistake. He often used to say, you should not read judgments like a statute. What he meant was that you shouldn't read other people's judgments like a statute. <laughs> Okay, we're coming now to the, um, to the last area, which is our sort of quick fire, quick fire round. What do you enjoy more in practice, the interpersonal skills, which are obviously an important part of being a barrister, or the intellectual exercise? I don't think I would distinguish between them. I enjoy both equally. Okay. The opponent that you respected the most while you were at the bar? Gordon Pollock. Gordon Pollock. Gordon Pollock was a, an, a, an extraordinary man in many ways. He got up judges' noses because he was extremely rude to them. Other barristers have been extremely rude to judges, but he was an absolutely outstanding lawyer. And normally, um, when he was extremely rude to judges, it was because he was right. That's not an easy thing to persuade (laughs) a judge at the other end of the exchange. Um, He was flamboyant. He was a terrific speaker. Was he South African as well? No, I don't think so. Okay. The judge who challenged you the most? I don't think I know the answer to that question. (laughs) All right. What is, for our listeners, the most important quality in an advocate? (laughs) Well, since I can only answer that question by identifying one quality, I will do so fairly arbitrarily. I think that it is a good idea that when you are halfway through a sentence, the judge should never be quite sure how you are going to end it. (laughs) <laughs> that, that way you will hold his attention <laughs> That's classic. great and what are the cases or what pick one case that you've argued that stands out for you and why i think abramovich and berezovsky because the facts were exotic it was difficult and it was my last case a day in the life of tell us a day in the life of uh, jonathan sumption the barrister uh, and tell us a day in the life of Lord Jonathan Sumption now. Uh, well, the barrister is just going to be more of the same. I, I get up. I don't bother with breakfast. I go into work a sufficient number of hours before the case starts to do the last-minute things that one has to do. Remember, I'm good for nothing after a glass of wine in the evening. <laughs> I wait I stay in chambers or in court until seven or eight o'clock. I then go back and have the said glass of wine. Now it couldn't be more different, except on cases cases like this when I'm talking to you. My main activity is writing the last volume of my history of the Hundred Years' War. That is a fundamentally undisciplined process, completely in that respect, unlike uh, practicing law. You can switch it on and off. You have to, because sooner or later, you just get sort of word block if you don't stop from time to time. Uh, I go on long walks in the country. Uh, I uh, enjoy my grandchildren. I do a lot of traveling, and I eat well. Again, this is from the the Guardian article. It says that you you dislike idleness. So you're, you're now working on the last volume of the Hundred Years' War. I only dislike idleness for myself. I'm perfectly happy with it in other people. Well, thank you very much. I feel yes. gratified. I feel yes, deeply gratified. Me, me too. Uh, <laughs> my question is, uh, what have you got planned after that? Uh, there was some talk of a, of a book on, on the Dreyfus affair. What have you got planned? I, the answer is I don't know. I shall be, I've been doing this book since 1979. It's been a lifetime companion. And when it stops there will be a large hole in my life, which I will need to fill in a hurry. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I will try and ensure that it's something that interests me and I hope that interests other people. Well, that's all I have. I don't know whether Roslan's got anything to to add on. 
Nope, nope, uh, nothing. That was yeah. fantastic. Thank you <laughs> yes. so much for uh, Lord Sumption. It's a pleasure. That, that was brilliant, Lord Sumption. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Advocates, the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to follow us on all our social media channels. Leave a review or share this episode and tag us. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you. Listen to the voices of the advocates.